I mean, I, I think obviously depending on how the win comes about, but like if you draw a scenario where Nebraska comes out and plays well, you know, Wisconsin team that just doesn't show up, it could be a really cathartic day in Memorial Stadium. And maybe that presents some good vibes and some good energy going into an Iowa game that has significantly less pressure if you have that six win already. So I, I think it'd be pretty substantial um, how things might look if Nebraska wins on Saturday because you remove that pressure. It's the whole conversation we've had really going back to the first opportunity with Indiana and then you had Ohio State and UCLA and, you know, each subsequent loss just adds more and more pressure. So if they're able to, to get that six win, I, I would love to see what that team would look like in kidding. I mean, I already think they have a chance to win both of these games, but I think their chance of winning at Iowa goes up if you already take care of business against Wisconsin. What's the, who's the most important group tomorrow? Mm. Well, I mean, it's always the defensive line for me. I think they just set the tone of that whole defense. So if that defensive line is able to get after Wisconsin's offensive line, you know, whether it's in the stopping the run game and, and Walker, or whether they're able to get after the quarterback and block and, and, you know, make things a little difficult. I mean, this is a banged up Wisconsin team that's playing. They played a heartbreaker of a loss against Oregon, but it reminded me in a lot of ways of kind of Nebraska, Ohio State, like, I think they caught a team at the right time. They were at home, and they maximized it. But it'll be how they choose to follow it up. And they've got to go on the road. They haven't played great on the road this year. They really haven't played great outside of that three-game stretch. And so I, I just think, like, you're catching them at the right time. And if Nebraska's defensive line can show up and show out, I think they can play, you know, a good, clean game and, and really kind of take it to Wisconsin. But – it, it requires them to come out and do it. It requires them to get off the field on third down. It requires guys to finish plays. All the things they couldn't do against USC in a game where they otherwise played well enough to be in it, but just couldn't finish the job. I mean, that's got to be the, the motto going into Saturday. They have to finish, finish the play, finish the game. Hey, I think this is an opportunity because you and I talked about him when he committed, and it's much more than just being the late Ken Clark's son in Quinn Clark. I know he got over... Look by some because, ah, he's from Bozeman, Montana. Who's he playing against? But if you watched his film, he's a he's an incredible athlete that is six foot five. And he went on to win, I think, didn't he win the high jump championship in Montana? Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's a great athlete. Yeah. Then you, then you see him, Shafe, and you, you see him and you go, damn, that guy is, that guy's only a freshman. And he's cock diesel. He's six five, 205. So is it more than just, he caught the eye of a new coach on the staff in practice, and he may get a little bit of run tomorrow. Or is this a bigger thing about young guys, opportunities, and maybe what a Dana Holgerson down the road is looking at for the kind of player he wants on the field? I think it can be a lot of different things. I mean, one of the ones you didn't mention, it's a motivation tactic. If Quinn Clark is getting in there and taking time away from Isaiah Nair and Jamal Banks because they're not giving max effort on blocking on the perimeter, I think that's a message that basically Dana Holgerson wants to send, like with two games left. Hey, you want to play? When we put you in, you got to give it everything you have. And so they think they're going to get that from Quinn Clark. Uh, as you mentioned, I mean, he's a good athlete, he's a bigger built guy. I think he has pretty good hands. And he's someone the staff was really excited about, regardless of you know, the fact that he was a legacy, he made it easier, I think, for, for him to be on Nebraska's radar. But he came in camp. And that's the guy that tried every position. Um, and they just liked his tenacity. Like he's someone that when he's on the football field, he's there to, to go play. And I think they appreciate that. And I would imagine that Holgerson has seen that as well. And I don't think it's just like a, you know, Oh, end of the season. Let's see what a young guy can do. I, I think if they're putting him in, the expectation is he's going to help. Them. And so I anticipate we see that on Saturday, you know, whether that's through the air or as I said, you know, as a perimeter blocker, he's a bigger guy. I mean, this was someone, they've talked to about he could continue to grow into being kind of a split out tight end. And so because of that, I think they think he can physically handle things on the outside. And, you know, it's been a little disappointing with Nebraska as much height as they added this off season. It would be hard to say that they've been physically dominant in any real game this year outside of maybe UTEP right at the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe he can give you a little bit of that. Speaking of Dana, Hol Dana Holgerson in the future, how much do you think the addition of Dana Holgerson helps with a guy like Cortez Mills? Well, I think it, it mm. 
consistently, you know, stands out. You look at the wide receivers that have had success for him throughout their time. You look at what he did for Justin Blackman in his, his year at Oklahoma State. I mean, I, I go to that one as much as anything because that's just the dream offense, right? And I don't know that you can give that the Big Ten across the nine-game conference plate. But, I mean, he had incredible quarterback play, fantastic running back play, and then the best wide receiver in the country in Justin Blackman. And so he was able to, to load him up and get him the ball. And, I mean, that's kind of what you're going to pitch. Is you've got a coordinator that, you know, you think is going to be there in 2025 that has produced some prolific offenses and has turned out some star star-level talent at wide receiver that have gotten to the league, which is where Cortez Mills wants to go. So I, I think it can only help. I think Dylan Riola is a bigger deal. I think Jamar Mosey and, and Garrett McGuire and the recruitment that those guys are doing might be a bigger deal than what Dana Holgerson is. But yeah, you can, you can sell them on the idea that that's the offense that's going to be playing at Lincoln next year. It's only going to help. And, you know, Oklahoma is, is helping you as much as anything with the struggles they're having. Uh, tomorrow, more wow or woe plays from the quarterback? I hope wow, but it's been a while since we've seen some wow. So, I mean, the safe bet would be woe, but I just I don't think this is a good Wisconsin team. And I believe that they can have a performance that's more indicative, and I go back to this game all the time, of the Illinois game, because that's when I thought Nebraska's offense was really clicking. And I don't know where that team went, but, you know, if they could pull it out for one game against a Wisconsin defense that's not that great and a Wisconsin team that might just go away if things get tough early, we could see some wild plays, absolutely. Uh, In wins, Dylan's got six touchdowns to two interceptions. In losses, he's got five touchdowns to eight picks. Is it as simple as protecting the football tomorrow for you? Yeah, I mean, it it definitely is. I, I think if they did a better job of that against UCLA, you know, if they have a better chance of winning that game, like you, that game is 13 7 at half. You know, if you protect the ball against USC, you don't have that dumb interception. Uh, you're able to force some interceptions, things of that nature. Like they're, they're just in a better situation. And so I think ball security is going to be a huge deal. And I think the team that does a better job with turnovers is ultimately going to win tomorrow. I know that's the most base analysis anyone can provide, but I think it's really true with these two teams and the way they're struggling. Well, we know Wisconsin is, has historically been really good on special teams. I think they're in ESPN's efficiency. They're eighth. They're really good in net punting. There's always the fear that they're going to take one back on a kickoff because we've seen that happen before. So let's leave special teams aside. They, it, because there's so much attention on offense because of Holgerson and Dylan and and Quinn Clark could possibly sneak in there and maybe some other wrinkles like Bonner last week played his most snaps of the year. But what – how do we get off the roller coaster shape of defense where defense looks like maybe for one of the rare times this year, what we were, what we were promised during the off season? Well, I think in, in a way the opponent helped them because they don't have Ethan Garbers and they don't have Eden, even the guy from USC who I don't think played well in Nebraska made him look a lot better. They don't have those wide receivers on either one of those teams. So Wisconsin's not going to challenge Nebraska as much vertically. Um, they're probably not going to be able to just pick on a Malcolm Hart dog. But what Nebraska continues to do, even against teams that aren't that great, they have these bus plays in the secondary. They have to play better. The secondary has to be better. I want to see young players out there. I mean, we talked about Quinn Clark and the motivation tactic there. I, there's a part of me that's just kind of beside myself. The mistakes that are happening in your secondary – could happen with young guys too and yet we see the same veterans with the same mistakes week in and week out when you preach accountability as often as this coaching staff does at some point it gets tuned out if you don't actually hold people accountable you can't continue to be the two guys that bust on the back end every single time and still get to be the starters i understand it's senior day but man i mean you guys know what I'm talking about, too. I don't even have to yeah, say yeah. yeah. the same two guys every single week. And it has been almost all year. You look at every performance where the secondary has struggled, it's either two or eight that has had a struggle, uh, you know, and sometimes both of them. And then you just have these big busts. And you just can't have it. And you certainly can't have it against a Wisconsin offense that has to grind for every yard. And so, you know, if they're able to, to play a little bit tighter because it's not as good of a team, you're not as worried about Brandon Locke, that kind of thing. But that could certainly help out. But we've seen it before where Nebraska plays down to their competition 
and they can't afford to do that defensively. Is there anybody particularly in that defensive back room you'd like to see from a young young player standpoint? Yeah, I mean, we saw Ramirez Stewart earlier in the year. You know, obviously there's Caleb Benning, there's Donovan Jones, there's all these guys, mm-hmm. there's, you know, and they, they all play different positions. And so I don't know exactly who it is that makes the most sense of safety. And maybe there just isn't someone that they're comfortable going with there. But I, I know from my perspective of sitting up in the press box, you, know, you can see where these busts are happening. You can see where guys are getting caught with their eyes in the backfield. And what really, I think, kills me is it's happening on run pits, too. Like, you're not getting to the spot where you need to be. And so the cutback lane is wide open because you're not there. And, you know, in a defense where everyone has to do their job. Do you remember how that was so much the conversation of 2023? It was 11 guys, regardless of who was in, were flowing to the ball, were doing their job, were, were playing their role. You haven't had that in 24, and I think that's a big deal because guys can't fill their role because they're slow. They're not there. They're, you know, they might be banged up or their eyes are in the backfield. They're in the wrong place, and so it's really hurt Nebraska. If you have eight defenders doing what they're supposed to do, one who's kind of in the area, and two that are wildly out there, that's where these things are happening. Mike Schaefer from Husker 24/7 joining us. Um, so. It's a big recruiting weekend for Nebraska. The signing period is December 4th, and because it's been moved up, I think we're going to see the flipping season just could be chaotic. Yesterday, Bryce Underwood goes from LSU to Michigan, and NLI, NIL is a huge part of it. Is there is there a lesson to be learned or something that a school like Nebraska that doesn't have the huge alumni base that Michigan has, they don't have an NFL owner who is worth you know seventeen billion dollars or whatever Stephen Ross is with the the Dolphins? Is there is there something from a school like Nebraska that can learn from that battle between Michigan and LSU yesterday that they're going to have to either adhere to or add moving forward to get big time difference making players out of high school? Well, I think the thing that you can learn and it's true of everybody, is that these recruiting battles do not die in the summer. They do not die early in the fall. They're going to go all the way to signing day. And and Bryce Underwood is just one of what I assume is going to be a lot of top 100 recruits. I mean, Dawson Merritt was one of them that are going to flip here in the month of November. And it might be NIL based and it might be, you know, performance based. But when you see a kid go from LSU to Michigan and the first thing that stands out to you is neither one of those teams are playing particularly well this season. So that kind of removes the conversation of that you have to be playing well. But, I mean, I I think that there's certainly – it's certainly an idea that you have to be an organized group. And I think that's one thing that Nebraska has going for us. They may not be winning a lot of games on the football field. There may be some questions about what's happening with the coaching staff. I think their recruiting operation has been rock solid. I think we saw that with Dawson Merritt. I think they've done a nice job of knowing when to emphasize and who to emphasize and, you know, when to kind of go all in. Now, the hard part of it is you have to play defense, too. They've got guys like Jeremiah Jones who can end up with Missouri, Malcolm Simpson who can end up with USC or Texas. And so you, you've just got to be able to fight it on all fronts. But it starts with being organized. It starts with having a plan. It starts with knowing how and when you want to attack, how and when you want to use your NIL money. I mean, Nebraska is going to have a finite amount of resources. And the other thing is Matt Rule doesn't want to commit to, you know, freshmen that have never played large sums of money because you also have to turn around and play in the transfer. You have to be organized. And it's just the, that's everything about recruiting. And it's, I think they're in a really good spot with it, but it wouldn't surprise me if there's another off season of change coming too, because I think Matt rule is still very much trying to learn where college football is at in 2024 and recruiting versus the world that he left in 2019. What did you make of Trey Taylor, the three-star quarterback out of Illinois, having Nebraska in his top 12 last night, despite Dayton Royal already being committed in that class. Is Trey Taylor a 26 or a 27? I want to say that he's a 27. I have that written down. You may be right. Let me let me let me let me double check. Well, you you might be right too. They've they've had other quarterbacks that have included him in their top group. That Michael Clayton committed to Illinois. He's 27. Uh, I apologize. You you are correct. Yeah. So I I mean one Nebraska's just kind of working down the list. Two they've got several quarterbacks coming in uh, tomorrow, and they're just. 
they're just trying to do what they can recruiting wise. I don't think Dayton Rayola is going to be the only quarterback in the 26 class. I think mm-hmm. they would be open on you know, Trey Taylor isn't that guy because he's 27, but I think they would be open to, uh, if there is someone else that is of interest to them. I mean, the big thing kind of moving forward, if your guy is Dana Holgerson, he's probably going to have some say in the type of quarterback that he wants to. That's so, true. you know, you're probably going to take Dayton, but you might find someone that fits maybe Dana Holgerson a little bit better. Um, so, you, you never know in, in that circumstance. But, yeah, Trey Taylor, he's an interesting talent out of Illinois. Nebraska's in his early top 12. I think this is his second visit to Lincoln for a game day visit. One of the things that's been unique when you look at these visit lists, J.J. Dunnigan, um, the kid Hunter Higgins out of Wichita. I mean, these guys have come in two, three times now. Like, they want to be in Nebraska for game day. I think that's usually a good sign of good recruiting going on. And Nebraska's 26 class could start off really quickly. You know, if they're able to win on Saturday, they're able to get a few yeses early, and then we're not talking about needing to get 11 guys in the month of June because you're already going into that month with double digits or more. Uh, we'll get you out there on this. How long into the game is there still a vested interest from the red side in tonight's game in downtown Omaha? Yeah, this one's going to be this one's going to be fascinating. I'm going to be there in my best neutral gray, um, sitting alongside my in-laws. Oh, gee, I knew. Hey, because I sat behind your uh, father-in-law last year at a Creighton game. Yeah, yeah. They're making well, you wear gray. Oh, no, no one's making me wear gray. I don't okay. own the basket. Though. I mean, I just don't have mm-hmm. it. So neutral gray is the best I can do for people here. Um, I'll wear my Norm McDonald sports hat, so that's bad. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I think it's weird because Nebraska lost on Sunday. I was at that game. There was spurt, especially late in the first half, where they looked like the best they've looked all year. Uh, so I think they have the ability to play good basketball, and that was a good St. Mary's team they lost. But don't let anyone tell you otherwise. That's going to be a tournament team. Um, and Nebraska lost by three in a game where they gave up 17 offensive rebounds and had 15 turnovers, including a five-turnover stretch when they had the lead in the second half. You can't do that. And so the big thing is I don't think that Creighton plays a ton of pressure defense, so they've got to be smart with the ball. You can't just give it away. They're going to have to make shots. I think they can hang around for a little while. I just have a tough time seeing the recipe for them winning that doesn't include getting the best performance of your year from Gavin Griffith, Connor Ezekian, maybe Bear K. Played really, really well up in two balls. you got to have Bryce Williams at a high level. Juwan Gary has to play at a high level. You have to stay out of foul trouble, and you have to get great in foul trouble. And those are things that happen very much. So it's a to me, it's a tough, tough formula for Nebraska to win this game. It's possible. Um, but it would require a really strong defensive effort, cleaning up the glass. Your bigs have to play well against Paul Krenner. I mean, and then, you know, you can't have Ashworth or any of these other guys go off. But it's just, uh, I, I just think it's going to be tough. But we'll see. I mean, I, I will say this. I think they're going to be ready to play. I don't think they're just going to have the doors blown off in the first five minutes. But can they hang around late in the second half? I'm a little dubious. Yeah. Well, enjoy the game. Uh, big fan of your uh, father-in-law. And he's got some great seats uh, near the uh, Creighton bench there at the CHI. Yeah, he's always threatening to give them up, but nobody believes him. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thanks, Shafe. Have a great weekend. I know you'll be busy. Uh, there'll be a lot of stuff on uh, 24-7 with uh, UBC and Brunts. Yeah. See you tonight, Shafe. Yep, that's uh,